As we go into section 4.4, uh, you would be surprised how intensively theoretical this section is. It's not about uh, applications. It's not about word problems. Uh, we are going to be learning two major theorems relating to calculus. One is called Rolle's theorem, R-O-L-L-E, that's his name. And then another uh, is called the mean value theorem. And so these theorems are basically the backbone that's going to tell us um, something really, really important about the function and it's increasing or decreasing and, and things like that. Um, and without these theorems, there's really no rigid or uh, rigorous way of knowing uh, those theorems, uh, those statements are true. Okay, so be patient and uh, start to learn mathematically, uh, start to learn to think mathematically. And what that means is, you know, think, in terms of definitions and theorems and arguments, proofs, so to speak, okay? And so um, this section will be quite different and it may be very challenging because it is very theoretical, okay? But try your best to learn the proofs um, represented in these, um, in these uh, statements, okay? So, and I, I think you would appreciate the uh, importance of uh, the theoretical aspect of calculus. All right, so let's get started in section 4.4, the mean value theorem. All right, so the major question here that I'd like to ask is this. If, um, let's say if the uh, value of the, fun the derivative is positive, okay, what does it mean? And the answer you may think, uh, say is, well, you know, it means that the function is increasing at that point. And then you stop and think, okay, did you just say that? Like, what does it mean for a function to be increasing at one point? Because one point is just one point, right? I mean, if you say the function is increasing, you at least need to have a small interval in which it is increasing, right? So can we even say that the function is increasing at a single point? Okay, and so that question actually turns out to be a very deep question. And I'm not sure if the two inventors of calculus, Leibniz and Newton, actually thought deeply about this because the, uh, the theory, okay, these uh, theorems that we will be talking about, the deep uh, theorems of calculus really didn't come for another two centuries or so um, after Newton and Leibniz first introduced to the world the ideas of calculus. All right, so in this section, uh, we are going to learn um, two major theorems, all right? And so we are going to discuss this, but before that, let me just think about, let me just tell you something uh, strange about this idea of increasing and decreasing. First, I have to give you the definition, the official definition of uh, what we mean by this idea, increasing, okay? So let's say f of x, is increasing, That's, this is the word I am defining, but I am not defining for you uh, what it means for a function to be increasing at a point, okay? Because that's pointless uh, to, be, uh, to be funny here, okay? No pun intended, but we don't talk about a function increasing at a single point because a single point, you just have this f of c, right? So we say f is increasing on an interval I, if and only if, okay. um, <clears throat> whenever A is less than B on this interval I, then F of A is less than or equal to F of B. So this is very much like, um, you know, this local or, you know, uh, uh, absolute maximum or minimum. What we are saying is if A is less than B, so A is to the left of B on the number line, then F of A cannot be greater than F of B. It's either equal or F of B is greater than F of A. If this is the case for any A, B in the interval I, then we say F is increasing on that interval. Right? And of course, the same is decreasing f of x is, or f is decreasing on an interval i, if and only if, whenever a 
is less than or equal, uh, less than R, B on I, then F A is greater than or equal to F of B. Okay, now do not switch A and B here. A is always considered less than B, strictly less than B. A is to the left of B. And as you go from left to right, uh, does the function increase? Does the function decrease? If it's you know, always increasing as you go from A to B, where B is greater than A, then um, its function is increasing. If it's going down or stays equal, then it's um, decreasing on that interval, right? So these we take as definitions. And it, again, it is very important for you to understand the definition. Now, uh, I'm going to give you this strange definition, a uh, strange example, which I gave you before. Let's say f of x, just to, to, to give you a point of how difficult this concept could be, all right? f of x is equal to sine of one over x. If x is not zero, and let's just define this to be zero if x is equal to zero. Now, remember this function, the sine of one over x as x approaches zero, it's going to just start to oscillate going back and forth, back and forth between positive one and negative one. As you go from the left, it does the same thing. It gets quicker, uh, faster and faster, and it just keeps going, okay? And if you zoom in, it's still going to be just like this crazy uh, oscillation between um, positive one and negative one. And this function just by itself on the top is not defined when x is equal to zero because you have this you know, zero denominator, but then explicitly we define f of zero to be equal to zero. Okay, now this is a function that is defined on all of the reals, right? Because for non-zero values, it's defined by the first line. For zero, it's defined by the second line. Now, you know that the, the limit does not exist for this function. We talked about this in section um, uh, in chapter two. And now we want to say that, the, what do you know about the derivative? Well, if it's not continuous at zero, it's not differentiable at zero. Okay, so is F increasing or decreasing in any small interval about one, about zero? So if you take any small interval, okay, above, uh, about zero or containing zero, you have all this infinitely many uh, up and downs going up like this, right? So if you take A here, and B here, okay, so you can say F of A is less than F of B, right? But if you pick another point here like this, then F of B or F of A is not, um, F of A may be greater than F of B, right? So you could not say in any interval uh, containing zero or in any neighborhood of zero, you could not say it's increasing because this is not true. And you could not say it's decreasing because this is not true. Right, and therefore, F is neither increasing nor decreasing on any neighborhood of zero in any I containing zero. Okay, so uh, it's rather crazy. Okay, now we don't have to really think too much about a uh, uh, complicated function like this, right? Um, but what we would like to say is that normally speaking, if F prime is positive, let's say on a certain interval, okay, if it, this is positive for all of the points on the interval, we wanna say the function is increasing. Uh, see, we want to associate the positive uh, derivatives with increasing and negative uh, derivative with decreasing. But we have to do this with special care to, um, you know, the reason for it. And, you know, does the mathematics guarantee such um, the, the pattern? Okay, and in order to prove that, unfortunately, we have to have this thing called the mean value theorem. And before that, to prove that, we have to have yet another theorem, which is called Rolle's theorem. All right, so this is one of the first theorems you learn with a, a, a person's name attached to it, named after a mathematician, Rolle. All right, so this is the statement of this uh, theorem. If F is, and in fact, you may want to list these things, number these conditions or hypotheses, right? If F is uh, continuous on the closed interval from A to B, okay? And if F is 
uh, differentiable on the open interval a, b. Okay, so we don't require that the function be differentiable at the endpoints. It has to be continuous um, on the closed uh, interval and differentiable on the open interval. Of course, it has to be defined on the closed interval to be continuous, right? So if it's uh, defined on a, b, continuous on a, b, differentiable on the open interval a, b, and and then there is a third and, and very important statement for Rolle's theorem or the conditions for Rolle's theorem. If A and B have the same value, if f of A is equal to f of B, okay, so it starts and ends at the same point here to here. Maybe the graph will be like this. Okay, maybe the graph will be like that. Okay, maybe the graph will be like this. But regardless, it's a continuous function and differentiable, meaning it's smooth, and it's going to start and end at the same y value as x goes from a to b. Okay, in that case, then the statement says there is a point, more technically, there is at least one point c on a b so c is between a and b such that f prime of c is equal to zero and you say huh like what why is this such an important thing it's obvious right or is it obvious uh this point c is where the derivative is equal to zero so in this picture this could be one of those or this could be one of those places all right it appears that in this picture there are two uh, values where C can be. C can be here or C can be here, right? Uh, that's okay to have two or more points. The, um, the Rolle's theorem actually says at least one, okay? So if the function goes like this, you know, FA and FB are the same, then you have this one point C where the derivative is zero. So uh, according to Rolle's theorem, if the function is differentiable on a closed interval, uh, open interval, and of course continuous on a closed interval, and if fa is equal to fb, then there is a point somewhere in the middle where uh, the derivative is equal to zero. Okay. Now you will see why this is important. This becomes the main ingredient to uh, prove the next theorem, which is the main topic of this section, which is the mean value theorem. All right. I'm going to give you a proof. Now we don't rigorously prove many functions. But for this section, it becomes important for you to understand um, how to prove this. Now, I'm not going to ask you to prove this on an exam or on your homework, but you should try to go along, read along, listen along, watch along, and make sure that you convince yourself, yes, it makes sense. Rose theorem is true, okay? All right, so here's the way it goes. Let um, Let's identify this point here. Let's call this K. Let K be the common value of F A and F B. I think uh, a precise picture will help. So let me draw that. All right, so this is function F. You have F A, F B, and both of these values are K on the Y coordinate. All right, so let, um, oh, on the Y axis, let K be the common, number f of a, which is f of b. All right, now case one, the picture doesn't have to look like this, right? Uh, if f of x is the same number k for all a, for all x on a, b. In other words, if, well, okay, so k on the open interval, we already know the value is k on the endpoints. So in addition to, the endpoints, if f of x is k all the time. So that means, you know, f is uh, constant. See, that's a possibility because all we know is that k is differentiable uh, and, you know, continuous, right? So if k is constant, that's case one, okay? In that case, the derivative is zero everywhere, right? Um, everywhere. So let C be any point on this open interval 
and you have f prime of c is equal to zero. The problem, see the statement just says there's at least one point on the open interval where the derivative is zero. We found one point. In fact, any point would do under case one. So that is a uh, sort of a trivial case, trivial meaning not so important. It's sort of an exceptional case because most likely you'll have up and downs, right? Ups and downs like this. So if that's not the case, all right? Uh, if that's not the case, Okay. By the uh, extreme value theorem, EBT, okay, F has a, an absolute maximum and minimum on the closed and bounded set AB. But um, <clears throat> if, so, so case two is, where you know case one is not true, right? So so suppose case one is not true, and so that means um, if case one is not true, case two is the all the other options. Okay, then there is a, there is x on a b such that f of x is greater than k. Actually, that's not true. Okay, so let's stop. So let's not do this, all right? I am going to change this part here um, because if case one is not true, there may be a point higher than k or lower than k, all right? So let's just assume one of them is true. Uh, by extreme value theorem, f has an absolute value, uh, maximum and a minimum on a, b. Okay, so suppose for case two that there is a point higher, okay, uh, higher than that, okay. So suppose there is a uh, x that is uh, on the uh, open interval so that f of x is actually higher than k, okay, at least one point. There, suppose there is a uh, an x on a b such that f of x is greater than k, right? Um, k may not be the uh, so so that means k is not the absolute maximum, right? Because by definition, I mean there is a point bigger higher than k, so that means then um, the absolute maximum. cannot happen at the endpoints A and B. Okay, so then what do we know about the absolute maximum if it can't happen at the endpoints, right? So then the absolute maximum must be at a critical point on somewhere between A and B, not the endpoints. All right, so uh, there exists, therefore, there exists a point C on A, B, such that F of C is maximum, is the absolute maximum. Remember, it doesn't happen at the endpoint, so it has to happen as an in an interior of this interval, uh, open interval from A to B, uh, is the absolute maximum, and it's a critical point. And f prime of c has to be zero, since now how do you know it has to be zero? Because it's a critical point, okay? And how do you know it's a critical point where the derivative is zero and not undefined? Because uh, f is differentiable everywhere. If f is differentiable in this open interval, that is one of the given statements, remember, uh, f is differentiable. Because f is differentiable, the derivative exists at every single point and, and f of c, uh, c is a critical point. That means the derivative is equal to zero, okay? That's it. We found a point where the derivative is equal to zero, okay? Case number three. Um, Finally, see, case one is if 
every point is uh, going to give you the same value k. And the second thing is that there is at least one point where it goes above k, right? What happens if the function is like this? There is no point above k, uh, and you know every point is below that. That's okay too. Suppose um, there is x on a b such that f of x is less than k. Then the argument is similar. The rest of that is similar. So that means k is not the absolute minimum. Right? So then the absolute minimum is not at A or B. It's not at the endpoint. Therefore, the absolute minimum must be at a critical point, just like before, on A, B. Let's call that C, OK? And so then, <clears throat> if it's not happening, the, the absolute minimum is not at the endpoints, it has to happen at a critical point. And because the, the, the function is differentiable, that means f prime of c must be equal to zero because c is a critical point. And we found that. So again, case three is similar to that. Now, you hope I hope you see that case one, two, and three cover all of the possibilities because it's either the function is constantly, you know, constantly k like this, okay, or it has at least one point above k or at least one point below k. In this picture, of course, you have both above and below, right? But the, the thing is, it's possible to have only going up from k or going down from k or constant. So cases one, two, and three cover all of the possibilities. And therefore, we have just proved Rolle's theorem, okay? So um, either way, either case one, case two, or case three happens, okay? At least one of these will happen. And in all of these cases, we found a point C on an open interval A, B, so that F prime of C is equal to zero. So that is the end of the proof of uh, Rolle's theorem. Okay, now the reason, and this is a, almost a trivial theorem, right? This sounds like a reasonable thing. Why do you have to prove it in such a, a rigorous way? Well, without rigorous proof, we couldn't claim this to be true all the time. Now we have a rigorous proof, a mathematical proof. We know that this is true, uh, right? Rolle's theorem guarantees that there is a point inside of the open interval a, b, where the derivative is equal to zero. All right, now this brings us to the celebrated and the most important mean value theorem. In general, if you have a, a theorem that is not just named like with a number like theorem 2.3 or theorem 1.1, whatever, if a theorem has a name, it, it must be an important theorem, right? And that's true, okay? And the mean value theorem abbreviated MBT is one such theorem. Arguably, this is one of the most important theorems in your first semester calculus or maybe in all of the calculus um, classes. Okay, I'm going to draw a picture to, to uh, show you what it tells you, what it states, and then we'll do a proof that is based on what we just learned, the, the uh, Rolle's theorem. All right, so the mean value theorem starts this way. If F is continuous on the closed interval AB, sounds very familiar, it's same as the beginning of um, the Rolle's theorem, and if F is differentiable on the open interval a b, so that uh, it means we we are not requiring the a function to be differentiable at the endpoints, but it is certainly differentiable on every point on the closed uh, on the open interval a b. So any point between a and b, the function has its own derivative. Okay, and then we don't require f of a to be equal to f b as before. Okay, so and if these two conditions are true, 
then the statement of the mean value theorem is that there is at least one point, sounds familiar, at least one point C on the interval, open interval AB, such that, that sounds very familiar, just like, you know, uh, Rolle's theorem, such that F prime of C is, now watch this, it's going to be FB minus FA all over B minus A. Now, what is that? Okay, that is the slope of the secant line. In this case, blue secant line. Also, we, all, we talked about this. This is the um, average rate of change. Average rate of change of F on the interval A to B. Okay, so this is a continuous function and differentiable on the open interval. And, uh, you know, function goes up and down. And what this means is there is a point C, at least one point, where the derivative is the same as the rate of change from A to B, the average change. Can you see where this point could be on this picture? Basically, what we are saying is we want to see the value, the, the point C to have the same derivative as the slope of the secant line. And you can see that, right? I think you can, at least I can spot two points. Here's a point where the derivative seems to be uh, parallel to the, uh, well, you know, the slope of this tangent line seems to be parallel to the blue line. There must be another point here, just around here, where the derivative, the, the slope of the tangent line seems to be the same as the slope of the secant line, all right? So the mean value theorem tells us that there is at least one point uh, where the derivative is the same as the rate of change over the whole interval, the average rate of change. Now, again, you could argue, you could wonder, why is this so important? It seems obvious, yes. It does seem obvious, okay? But it, we do need to have a rigorous proof so we can claim once for all that this is true. Anytime these two conditions are met, and we will use this fact to say something very important about the uh, derivative being positive or negative over an interval, okay? It has to do with increasing and de decreasing, but we can't get there to state that which is obvious unless we have strong and sure foundations of the mean value theorem, which is based on Rolle's theorem, okay? I hope you appreciate this mathematical development. Okay. In order to prove uh, something that seems to be obvious here at the beginning about increasing and decreasing functions on an interval, we have to have the mean value theorem. But to have that, we have to have Rolle's theorem. And by the way, Rolle's theorem required the extreme value theorem. So that really is at the lowest, the most fundamental aspect of all of these. Okay. Once you take this one out, you don't have Rolle's theorem. And without Rolle's theorem, you can't have the mean value theorem. And without that, we can't claim what we are about to say about increasing and decreasing functions. All right, so, so there. Okay, now the mean value theorem. Let's talk about how, why this is true. Now, how do you prove this, okay? And like I said before, the proof depends on Rolle's theorem, but Rolle's theorem requires a function like this, and f of a to be equal to f of b. So that is the first thing we are going to do, All right? Now watch this, okay? So um, this, this line L, let's talk about this line, the blue line L. Uh, the blue line L, this is really not a part of uh, official proof, okay? But blue line L, how do you, can, can you come up with the equation of this blue line L? Uh, the slope of this blue line is f of b minus f of a over b minus a, right? That is the slope, which is exactly this thing here. And that's a difference quotient, okay? So that's a slope. It's a given number because a and b are fixed points, right? And so that's a slope. And it goes through the, the, a couple of points, uh, a, f, a and then B, F, B, of course. So let's try to write down the equation of L using this information, 
Okay, so uh, this y minus f of a, this is the point slope formula, a form of the equation of the line. F minus f, uh, f minus y1, sorry, f, oh, sorry, y minus y1 is equal to m. times x minus x1. All right, so this is the equation of that blue line. Okay, so it's going to be fa plus this whole thing. Ooh, this is ugly. Okay, but that's, this is the equation of the, the uh, L, the blue line. I say line that is blue in this picture here, right? That's the equation of L. Now, what we want to do is, I, I want you to look at this picture and look at the difference between this given F and the line, okay? F and L are at the, at the same point, you know, at F and L cross each other at A and B, right? So if you have F minus L, then the, that value, in fact, let's define this equation that's uh, F minus L. Note, f minus f of x minus l, given function minus l is equal to zero at a and zero at b. And of course it's continuous on the closed interval a, b and open interval a, b. So if we can find this, this is going to satisfy the conditions of Rolle's theorem where f of a, uh, where this, evaluated at A and this evaluated at, evaluated at B will be equal to zero, right? So this satisfies the conditions of Rolle's theorem. So this is the trick used to prove the mean value theorem. We're going to create this function. We're gonna call this G. Call it G, okay? So we are creating the function, new function G that's based on that blue line and F so that this function G would satisfy Rolle's theorem. So maybe we'll start the proof now. This is just a forethought, a strategy for our rigorous proof, okay? Let's start the proof right here, okay? I'm going to define this function, the difference between F and L. So let's call this G, G of X to be f of x minus this gigantic line L, which is this thing, f of a, which is a fixed certain number, plus f b minus f a over b minus a, where this fraction represents the slope of the, uh, the secant line, and then x minus a. That is my function, g, okay? I claim that this g, is going to satisfy Rolle's, uh, the conditions for uh, Rolle's theorem. All right, so first of all, G is F of X, that's a differential, differentiable function, minus all of these, this is a real number, plus a real number times X minus A. So this is just a composition in the sum of real valued functions or you know, uh, continuous functions. So G is continuous because it's a sum of two continuous functions, continuous on A, B and differentiable on the open interval A, B, just because this has that you know, property, a continuous on the closed interval, interval and differentiable on the open interval. And the same thing for this and this, all of these are smooth and continuous and differentiable functions. Right, so G is continuous on A, B and differentiable on the open inter interval A, B. Now let's see GA. Now GA, remember G is simply a difference between F and L. So at end, the, the two endpoints, G should be zero. Let's verify that. G of A is equal to F of A minus F of A plus F B minus F A all over B minus A times what's X? X is A, right? So A minus A. Ooh, so that means this whole thing is zero because that's zero. 
All right, so it doesn't matter what the coefficient is. And so basically it comes down to a f of a minus f of a followed by a big zero, but that's zero. Okay, so g of a is equal to zero. What's g of b? It better be zero because we made g to be that way. f of b minus, remember now, f of a is a constant plus this differential difference quotient, which is also uh, some given constant. And then x, you know, we replace x with b, so it's b minus a. So this time, this and this cancel. What's left is f of b minus f of a. Now, um, you gotta be careful here, right? Because this is plus, but you have a negative sign right here. And so that would be minus f of b. And then this last, this negative sign changes to the positive sign. You have negative times ne uh, negative. So that would be plus f of a. And of course that's going to cancel to be zero. All right, so g of x satisfies the three conditions of Rolle's theorem where f uh, g of a and g of b are equal to each other. Not only are they equal to each other, they are zero, okay, uh, Rolle's theorem. And therefore, there exists, oh, oops, sorry. There is, that was a mathematical symbol. There is a, at least one point, C on the open interval a, b. So it's, you know, a less than equal, less than b, less than b. C somewhere between a and b such that f prime of c is equal to, uh, sorry, g prime of c is equal to zero. Okay, so what's g prime? But g prime of x is the derivative of this gigantic function. Uh, so that's going to be fx, f prime of x, minus this whole thing, okay? So what is the derivative of this gigantic thing? The derivative of this function is going to be zero, but the derivative g prime is equal to f prime minus, okay, now this is a constant, so we don't have to worry about that. And then if you multiply this part out, okay, you know it's this times x minus some constant, right? The constant can disappear. So the only, the, the only part important here is the coefficient of x, which is actually this whole difference, difference quotient. So that is our difference quotient. It's minus f b minus f a, all over b minus a. And of course you have this x in here, but x disappears when you take the derivative. So this is equal to zero, okay? That is the, uh, oops, sorry, that's, that's, uh, that's not equal to zero. I am just making a statement, but th that, that the derivative of g at any given x is this whole expression. Okay, and we are saying that at this particular point C, we know that there is guaranteed at least one point C uh, between A and B, so that G prime of C is equal to zero. And so if you plug in G, uh, sorry, C for X in here, we have G prime of C is equal to F prime of C minus this whole thing. And that's equal to zero. Okay, now focus on this last part here. This says f prime of c must be this difference quotient. All right, and that's the proof that we have found at least one point c on the open interval a, b, such that f prime of c is equal to the difference quotient. And that c is illustrated in this picture by at this, this point and this point. In this picture, there are two points that would satisfy, um, or that can be this point C between A and B, so that its derivative, the function, the derivative of the function at C is equal to that average rate of change from A to B. Okay, so that is called the, um, that's the proof of the uh, mean value theorem. All right, so all it says is that there is at least one point in the interval where the derivative is equal to the um, 
the difference quotient, the average rate of change, okay? That is called the mean value. And so it's called the mean value theorem. All right now, what are we going to do with this mean value theorem? This is actually going to serve as the basis or um, the uh, active ingredient as we make some important claims, of, uh, claims about F being increasing or decreasing, okay? So that part is going to be covered in the second part of this video for section 4.4.